I'd love to. Thanks a lot, Nick. Appreciate it. Welcome, everyone, to our main policy pours for the very end of January, already a month in to the new year, 2021. So much better than 2020 already. Um, and it's a pleasure <laughs> to have you here, guys. I, again, I want to reiterate, I am very much looking forward to seeing you all as humans in person someday. And uh, hopefully that will be able to take place at some point in the mid part of this year, I would think. Um, we're going to try to have an event as, as quickly as we humanly possibly can. So look, you know, stay tuned and keep open for that stuff. But in the meantime, uh, we have had great luck doing this time type of event and uh, are very pleased to once again welcome you all in here for our for our virtual happy hour. So before I get going, obviously there is a topic for today that we wanted to really touch on and talk about uh, quite extensively, which is the emergency powers reform movement in the state of Maine. And we have a new report that uh, Nick is going to detail a little bit about the details that are inside of it and what we found, what we're talking about in all of our work in the legislature, which uh, which both uh, Jake and Mike will also be talking about um, as well. Before I do that though, just wanna really quickly, I think I saw her face in there somewhere and I know she's in the office two door, doors down for me, but Melissa, are you around? There you are. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our newest employee. This is Melissa Baker. She is now our development associate here at the Maine Policy Institute. She actually came on uh, with us as an intern um, in, God, I guess it was uh, November or December. When did you start exactly? I can't remember exactly when it was that it started because these days and weeks stretch so far. But uh, she did a fantastic job, and uh, she was uh, she's now graduating um, at, in the end of this next semester, and we're very pleased to welcome her on as a development associate for the next 200 years. So, Melissa, say hello to everybody. You don't have to give too much detail by yourself, but uh, maybe just give everyone a quick hello and, uh, you know, uh, what uh, your background is a little bit, and then we'll kind of kick off the rest of the meeting. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Melissa Baker, as Matt had introduced me. Um, I recognize a few names around here. Uh, so nice to meet you all. And I'm really excited to be working at the Maine Policy Institute. I am a communications major at uh, the University of Southern Maine. And luckily, um, Matt and Heather have hired me on to be their uh, donor relations and event manager. Um, so I'm very excited um, to be helping out Maine Policy and to be working with all of you. Thanks, Melissa. So this being her first meeting, we're not going to ask her to detail any specific policies and really get into the dirt here yet, but uh, we're very pleased to have her on board. She's already doing a great job. So you all probably will likely talk to her at some point if you give us money, which we always encourage you to do. Uh, you might get a thank you call or a, or a letter that, uh, that Melissa typed up for us. So appreciate you guys uh, welcoming her on board here. Now, all that said, let's get into the actual uh, meat and potatoes of our presentation here today. As we always do, I like to go around and talk to the staff and get their perspective on various things. Uh, everybody has their own duty here today to tell you a little bit about where we stand in the legislature and some of our uh, some of our policy work. But to kick things off here, I wanted to make sure I gave you guys the broad strokes kind of overall view of where we're going and what we're doing right now as it relates to this subject. Um, the, the governor's executive powers um, are a monumental problem that virtually no one knew was a problem about a year ago. Um, we've now seen, not just here in Maine, but all across the country, the extensive abuses that have taken place as a result of the broad latitude that's given to uh, chief executives in many states, most states, um, certainly here in Maine as well. And it has enabled far too many people to essentially rule their state by themselves uh, without any sort of input, checks or balances or protections in the system to ensure that, uh, that one person doesn't grow too powerful and do too much. Um, clearly, that's a great example here in the state of Maine that needs to be addressed in some fashion. I joked in our last, um, in our last uh, Maine Policy Pours meeting that we had together, although it's not really a joke, uh, that I would uh, basically do absolutely nothing but this for the next year, two years, six years, 200 years. I don't care how long it takes. This is the one thing I'm going to accomplish in my life before I die is getting rid of this particular provision in Maine state statute and dealing with this question for the future. Because I have to imagine, I, I certainly don't want this to be true, but I have to imagine at some point in the future, some future group of people in Maine, uh, Maine lawmakers, Maine governors, and people at the Maine Policy Institute and beyond are gonna be dealing with this problem again. And when they do, I don't want this to be repeated. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we've learned throughout this process. 
And so what I asked Nick to do um, and all of our staff at Maine Policy Institute to do is actually come up with a real evaluation of the full extent of Maine's executive powers. Uh, you know, what does the government, what, what is the governor allowed to do? What is the governor not allowed to do? What are the various statutes in play? How does this work? Uh, and, and what potentially could be some avenues for trying to amend or revise or reform this whole thing? Um, part of that, and I think uh, perhaps one of the most useful things that, that Nick just did in his report that we just released this morning, was actually take a look at other states and what they did and see how it varies state to state, who has what power, what are the limits on it, who checks what, where are the balances, uh, who's good, who's bad, in between, right? And so he's going to have a lot to say about that in just a moment, but that's really the basis of this project. To give you uh, a quick window into what our work will look like, though, this is a pretty tough place to advocate for a restriction on a governor's power like this. Right now, the state Senate and the state House are both controlled by Democrats, which is, of course, Jana Mills' political party as well. And they have a rather comfortable majority in the Senate and comfortable enough in the House uh, that they don't have to do anything that they don't want to do. They can ignore us entirely. Although, one thing that I think we learned this week is that if you are loud enough and if you are aggressive enough, you can make the governor spin on an issue in 48 hours or less. Uh, we saw that happen with the PPP loan issue this, this uh, week when the governor on Monday told the, legislate, uh, the legislature during a committee meeting, uh, or actually it was her commissioner of the Department of Administrative and Financial Services, but either way, told uh, the legislature that they were planning to actually get about $100 million or so by not fully conforming with federal tax law and by not doing that, taxing PPP loans as income. Uh, that obviously is horrific and unconscionable that she would even consider doing that kind of thing in the middle of a horrendous recession um, in a pandemic. It's, uh, some, it's exactly the last group of people you want to be targeting right now to try to soak them for $100 million. And so when she, that was announced, immediately we set into action. I'm sure you guys all got our emails. Uh, we sent out multiple emails on this subject. We also did a lot of work behind the scenes to try to organize people to call and actually use that whole grassroots activism thing that we're always talking about here to try to get some pressure applied to the governor so that she actually understood the full weight of the decision she was making and just how bad it was. And uh, on top of that, uh, you know, I, I wrote a column, Jake did some stuff in the main wire, you know, there were other groups that were involved too. And uh, I spent a good three days on my radio show just hammering her as well on, on top of everything. So that all combined for her hearing from everyone. And you saw the result of that. She yesterday afternoon sent out a press release saying that, you know what, maybe we should take a look at this and maybe we shouldn't do that, which is one of the fastest reversals and backtracks I've ever seen in my life. That's a good thing. We're not done yet though. If you noticed in her release, you, you will have seen that she was uh, not talking at all about reducing her spending growth in her budget. 400 million extra dollars is something she wants to protect. And so she's not gonna cut it down to 300 million extra dollars. She's gonna try to look for other federal funding to try to fill the gap. So clearly we're still gonna be advocating on this and clearly our position is that that $100 million, while it sure would be nice, Janet, uh, is definitely something that you're going to want to not spend and, and pull that back. So lots of advocacy there. But my point in telling you this little story is that advocacy matters, grassroots activism matters, and your voice matters. So even though the state Senate, and even though the state House, and even though the governor's mansion are all full of people that don't want to change emergency powers, if we actually organize and we make this a real priority, which we're going to, um, we hope that we have some ability here to actually make some changes in this regard this year. And if we don't, somehow we come up empty on this, it will be my mission next year, and the year after, and the year after that, and the year after that until this changes. So I have now blathered on long enough. I do want to start uh, tossing things back to my staff so that they can go through some of this. Nick, I'm going to start with you. Take a sip of that water of yours. And uh, I'd like you to tell the people about the report that we just issued this morning and what you found on the inside of that. Nick, go ahead. Sure. Thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited to uh, unveil this report. Uh, let me just pull up my screen here. I'm, uh, I'm uh, broadcasting from a, uh, an undisclosed location in uh, Northern York County here. So let me just make sure that I uh, 
I'm clear on, on there, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to share this with all of you. So I, I looked back in, uh, in December or so it was early December. I went through every state's emergency powers law, um, all 50 states, <clears throat> they, they each have some either a dedicated law about it, or it's sort of a hodgepodge of things. Um, but each state deals somewhat with how a governor can declare a state of emergency. Um, so, you can find it on our website if you head to mainpolicy.org. Of course, the first slider that comes up here um, is the map, and uh, and uh, this is where I'll take you. But uh, this is really what what came down. You can go online and, and read read the background and all of that. Of course, I'll explain it. But really, the idea was, you know, after we watch so many governors uh, use their power in unprecedented ways. It wasn't necessarily that it was against the law or, or it was an abuse of power, although there have been some of those instances around the country. Um, it was really about how much power does a state legislature give to the governor in a state of emergency? How do they define a state of emergency? What's the process? You know, um, watching Governor Mills being able to continue the state of emergency uh, essentially in perpetuity unless the legislature steps in seemed like it didn't protect individual liberty enough, right? So the, the idea, the perspective really is to look at this through the lens of sound constitutional government that has a balance between co-equal branches. There's a reason why uh, Article One of the U.S. Constitution takes on Congress. Um, it's because the legislature is the people's branch. It's the most deliberative branch. Um, it has the most amount of people, diffused amount of uh, power diffused among them. Um, so it is the most uh, protective of liberty, the executive branch, as the founders had warned us countless times, um, that it is it can tend towards tyranny, um, especially when power is concentrated in the hands of a few. So coming to that conclusion, um, you know, we I, I took on uh, took on grading these these state statutes. And what you'll see in this uh, this map visualization here, each state has a score uh, out of 100. The lowest score you see up here is 30, um, and the highest score is 100. So uh, no state got 100, and no state got zero, but the lowest was, was Vermont here at 31, uh, as you can see in dark red. So the five categories that I, that I took to, to develop this scorecard, because it's, it's five categories, um, and then it's sort of uh, averaged across all five of those, the link down at the bottom of that that map will take you to this greater spreadsheet, which is where all of my notes are. Um, and you see all the states here, you see the, the different laws that are cited, um, but you'll see the five categories up at the top. Um, and that, that will be the how the state of emergency is declared, what's the process um, by which a state of emergency is declared? Um, is it just the governor? Um, does the legislature need to you know, concur after so many days? Um, the next one is how is the state of emergency terminated? D does the legislature have to step in and terminate it or can it simply deny a concurrence vote every few days or every month or so? Um, the third category is what is that time limit? How long is each emergency going to last or supposed to last? And then do the powers of the governor last after the official termination? Not many states have that, but some do. Um, and then the last category is the governor's authority to amend or suspend or modify either statute or regulation. Um, that that's that's pretty diverse as well. But there's really only three ways you can do it. You know, the governor has no authority to do either uh, change either. Um, the governor can change or amend just regulations, or they can amend uh, or change or or excuse me, suspend um, a statute and regulation. Uh, as, as far as I found, there's only one state that uh, can, the governor can essentially create law or regulation within an emergency, and that's North Carolina. So there are, there are a couple of specific cases there, but um, we can dig into that a little bit later. But that's the five categories that I base the scorecard on. The first two categories, whether uh, how, how an emergency is declared and how it's terminated, those are weighted double in this, uh, in this, this case. So um, just kind of hovering over certain states, you can you can see uh, it pulls all of those entries into this. Um, let me see if I can zoom in on here for for you all. I'm not sure if that will if that will help, but um, so yeah, you, you'll see you'll see the entries come up here. So let's let's take on the the highest and the lowest, shall we? So Vermont got the lowest score, 31. Sad for our neighbors uh, in northern New England. Um, it's tough. 
it's tough. But the governor has a lot of power. He's the sole judge of whether an emergency exists. He's a sole judge of whether it uh, is over. Um, so there's no legislative check on on whether the emergency gets to continue or or what. Um, there are uh, 12 or 13 states which have that arrangement where the governor is the sole judge. That includes Hawaii um, and Arizona, um, different places. But what really took Vermont out of that mass, you know, mass of sort of mediocre laws and brought it to the bottom of the barrel was this provision that allows the governor, who, uh, when, when he enacts emergency orders, uh, executive orders pertaining to energy transmission or the environment, those orders are in effect 180 days uh, after the official termination. They, they can last up to 180 days after, that's six months after the end of an emergency. Um, I just think that's that's uniquely Vermont to to allow for energy transmission rules and, and environment rules to carry on for, for six months. But that's uh, based on my rubric um, that, that, that brought them to the bottom. So let's go to the top two. Kansas got the top spot. Um, which has a has a unique, somewhat unique law, but it's just more stringent on the governor, which that, that's what placed it apart from South Carolina and New Hampshire and, and whatnot. So, you know, the, the, the governor in Kansas can declare a state of emergency, but the legislature after two weeks, after 15 days, has to approve it, has to concur uh, with the governor's uh, pr proclamation that there is an emergency. Um, but the legislature itself may only approve one 30-day extension of that emergency. Um, any successive extensions of that by 30 days at a time has to come from a unanimous vote of the, the state finance council. So it's important to note that this scorecard isn't to measure the performance of different governors individually across 2020. I think that's going to be a question that we'll all tackle um, in the coming years. This was really just to look at how is the emergency statute for these different states structured? And does it protect liberty? Does it balance the people's branch with uh, an executive? Does it, does it allow a, a ch the chief executive to continually give themselves uh, expanded powers over and over again? Um, and it was, it was an important question for me um, because it's, it, you know, this is, this is sort of the, back, the backbone of our system. This is the backbone of, uh, of the American system. The, the, the cool thing about the constitution and, and uh, the federal system um, is that we have these co-equal branches of government. And at the same time, the state legislatures get to decide a lot of how their laws are structured. Um, I sort of preface the report with the background of all of this, you know, the, the 10th amendment uh, delegates any powers not expressly uh, delineated to the federal government, to the states. Um, and then you have, you have uh, these, these Supreme Court precedent dating back to 1905. Actually, if you, uh, if you joined us for the legal happy hour earlier uh, last year, I believe it was in April or May, we, we had a panel of three lawyers talking about this, but uh, it's Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905. There was a pastor in Cambridge who denied a mandatory vaccination for smallpox and admitted outbreak. Um, and, but the Massachusetts legislature had passed a law that enabled local uh, communities, in this case, Cambridge, to mandate vaccination for any adult and, and, and ch child, I believe. So this pastor, uh, Jacobson, he, uh, he challenged it um, on the basis of equal protection that he, uh, he said that, you know, the federal government should extend the Bill of Rights through this, the, uh, the equal protection of due process under the law um, through the 14th Amendment's equal protection clause should apply to me because this is my state government infringing on my liberty the Supreme Court disagreed with him and sort of set the stage for understanding that, you know, states have a pretty broad latitude in emergencies to designate what powers, uh, who has what power in, in an emergency. Um, so that that has set the stage and that's that's an, uh, over 100 years, obviously, of precedent here that, that we're building on. Um, but uh, in, we haven't had a federal case to that level, but there were some state cases earlier this year um, if you've been following what's going on in Michigan, for, in, for instance, uh, you'd, you would think that the grade that Michigan would get here would be much worse because of the way that Gret Gretchen Whitmer, the governor, has acted this year. Um, but it's a really interesting case, and I spell it out in the report. Basically, you know, they had a law where the, uh, uh, the governor, well, their, their current law, this, this current law, the last one that was drafted in the 70s, requires the governor to go back to the legislature every 30 days and get a, an extension approved. Um, after the first uh, extension in April or after the first 
period of state of emergency in April, uh, Governor Whitmer went back to the legislature, asked for an extension, was denied an extension, still kept issuing her orders pointing to a law from the 1940s that said that she didn't need legislative approval. She could work on, she could issue these orders without legislative approval. Um, one of our, uh, our, our partner organizations uh, and, and friends and colleagues out there in, in Michigan, uh, the Mackinac Center, they put together a lawsuit and, and sued the governor over this. Um, the Supreme Court eventually ruled uh, in two separate rulings, the, the state Supreme Court, they ruled unanimously that the governor couldn't uh, make law, so they had to strike down. Um, they had to strike down the 1945 law. They said, uh, "No, it's it's non. Uh, you can't delegate legislative power to the governor like that." Um, and then what they also did, they uh, right, right. So they struck down the 1945 law, and so after that, Governor Whitmer said, "Well." You know, I actually have this other statute that enables my public health department to issue these sorts of orders. So they still have, they're the only state operating um, with, without a state of emergency. They're, they're not under a state of emergency anymore, yet their public health department issues these emergency orders, um, not through the governor, but, but through public health um, to implement curfews and various business restrictions similar to what we've seen here. Um, so even though Michigan has a fairly uh, good emergency law, the governor essentially isn't following it. So that, that's, a, that's a big exemption, uh, exception there. I think it's interesting to contrast that with Ohio because the same thing's happening in Ohio. The public health director is issuing these orders, but they still are, and, and, and the statute sort of lets them do that without a state of emergency, but they are in a state of emergency because the law is so broad. There's, there's barely any checks on the governor himself to, to do that. He, he's pretty much the sole, um, sole arbiter of whether there's, a, there's an emergency. Um, I want to make sure that I leave some room for folks to ask questions. Um, we do have some other special cases in, uh, and some ideas for reforms. So I'd love to get into those. There's a lot of bills that are out there. Um, and there's a lot of energy, especially on the, uh, the Republican side in the state house and the state Senate to reform 37B, which is the, the law that, that, uh, uh, delegates the governor's emergency powers. So, uh, Matt, if I could kick it back to you, maybe we have some questions from folks, or maybe we can uh, get, get into something else more deep. Yeah, why don't we, um, unless there's an immediate question right now, um, and if you have one, please go ahead and type in the chat that you'd like to ask the question, and we'll open up your mic and you guys can ask it. Just say, hey, I have one, or you can ask it in the chat and I'll try to, I'll give it voice for you if you want. Uh, either way, let's uh, probably save those until we get through the rest of the staff, because I don't think their updates are really terribly long, and then we can do a Q&A kind of at the end. Um, before I go to, I'll go to Jake next. Uh, before I do, though, I just want to say one thing about this project, just to make sure everybody clearly understands this. I think it's very unfortunate that it's inevitably going to be a partisan issue. Um, this really should... to this really should have nothing to do with Governor Mills or Governor Whitmer or Governor uh, Sununu or, or Governor uh, DeSantis. I mean, it, it really shouldn't matter who the governor is, what political party they're, uh, they're a member of. And that's certainly the case with what my view is of this in Maine right now. If Governor LePage was in charge right now, I might like some of the decisions he's making better. Um, but ultimately, I, I don't, I am not comfortable having a single human being having this much unchecked authority, I mean, even, even if they're making good decisions, even if they're making the right call. I mean, you know, the emergency declaration is a great example of this. I really don't have too much of a problem with us being in a state of emergency. I mean, you know, we can chat about it, we can quibble about it, I suppose, but I don't really care that much about whether or not we're in a state of emergency. I do, however, care that the state of emergency is really up to one person and whether or not they want to continue to issue those declarations and that there's no check on that. And when you've seen in some states that have a split uh, government where you have a, a member of one party in charge of the governor's mansion and a member uh, or members of another party in, in charge of the state legislature is you've seen skepticism. Hey, let's take a look at what you're doing. Do you really need to do it that way because of the natural tension between the two parties that exists? In states like Maine where it's, it's one party rule, and I would assume the same thing is true of uh, Republican states as well, there's really no skepticism there. And I hate when there's no skepticism in government. There needs to be. There needs to be people that are asking questions. I know for a fact, for instance, the Democrats are very uncomfortable with what's going on and what has gone on up to this point. They did not want to be put on the sidelines. They did not like being shelved and they didn't like the governor making decisions by herself. But, you know, it's a team game in politics oftentimes. And so they knew, especially in an election year, probably not the best idea to 
complain about it publicly and take on the governor and really try to do something to change this law. So I'm hoping now that we're into 2021 that there might be more oxygen in the room to make that kind of thing happen. Obviously, it's still going to be an uphill climb, but I, I just really want everybody to understand that this is not intended to be, nor should it really have anything to do with partisanship in the least bit. So with Matt, that, I just, yeah, Matt, go ahead. Can I, I just add that it's, it's important to just understand that, uh, that it, it, this is, um, um, oh, geez, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just lost my, my notes there. Please, please carry on. I'm so sorry. We'll carry on. There's <laughs> lots of things that are important, Nick, and I'm sure you'll, you'll uh, have a chance to, to remember oh. what you were saying there in a second. Uh, so with that, let's move on now to Jake. I want to have uh, Jake give a quick update on some of the stuff we were talking earlier, Jake, about some of the grassroots activism and things we've done to really get people involved in the process. I know there's some stuff there that you wanted to chat about. So why don't you go ahead and take it from here, Jake? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And I, I absolutely echo your sentiments that, uh, you know, I hope there's more oxygen in the room here in 2021 to take action on some of these issues that we're discussing today. Uh, the, the main policy communication shop is quite busy right now getting this report out as well as staying on top of everything that the governor is trying to do. You got emails from us about the PPP issue and then another one today thanking you. Uh, cannot thank everybody who participated enough in getting involved and Matt is absolutely right. That is the kind of advocacy and engagement that we need to make a difference. Uh, and when we all band together and make our voice heard, uh, we, we, we can impact uh, a lot of positive changes here in the state of Maine. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to continuing to work with everyone out there. Uh, and the one thing that I wanted to talk with you all about today um, is a cool little advocacy tool that we are going to unroll here very shortly when some of our bills start being released as LD numbers. Uh, we are going to be utilizing a platform called One Click Politics, um, which it actually requires a little more than one click, but nonetheless, uh, you can with uh, just a few clicks anyway, uh, send multiple different messages to mul multiple different people all at one time. So you can initiate an email, a phone call, a Twitter message, as well as make a 30 second video to send to uh, any legislator lawmaker, the governor, whomever. Uh, so as our bills start moving through the legislative process, get assigned to committee, get assigned to public hearing dates, work sessions, so on and so forth, uh, we will be putting that tool up on our website for you to use. We'll send out emails. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know all about it. Um, but it's a great advocacy tool to reach multiple people all at once in one foul swoop, if you will. Um, and really looking forward to it. And please continue the level of engagement and advocacy that you're in now. Keep it up for the next however long the legislature is in session because it really does make a difference. Uh, and if you want, you know, any more proof, just look at what happened over the last 48 hours. Thanks, Matt. All right. Uh, really quick update from Jake. Let's also toss things over to Mike, who is, of course, deeply involved in uh, in all of our lobbying efforts in the legislature. Not that that looks like it usually does this year because we, we're not really heading up to Augusta quite as often, are we? Uh, Mike, go ahead and take it from here. What's your update? Um, as of this afternoon, there are 287 actual bills released out of the 14 or 100 or so requests. Uh, I've been noticing that the revisor's office is putting out absolute duplicate bills, uh, which usually they consolidate. I don't, I don't know what that means. One of my concerns is that out of the 287 bills, there are 33 concept drafts, which means these are placeholding bills. Sometimes these bills have utility. Uh, my experience is, is most of them do not. Um, out of those 33, 12 are only title only. So um, with the lack of access and lack of transparency with public hearings being held by Zoom meetings, um, typically with these concept drafts, which literally have no legislative language, an act to amend main tax laws is the name of the bill. And the language says an act to amend, uh, amend main tax laws. So we won't know until the hearing what these bills do. Uh, again, I, I find most of these bills have have you know little utility for the for the process, but it's alarming to think it's over ten percent. Just think, we're expecting around fourteen hundred bills. Okay. In past, we've had twenty four hundred. Could you imagine two hundred and forty bills that have no language? 
and they just placehold 240 bills. So um, I'm alarmed at that rate. Um, I'm always one that's very skeptical um, uh, of anybody who's in charge to echo Matt's uh, uh, concerns. So um, I'm always thinking that um, there are people who have said there's no good crisis that goes to waste. So I always like to bring uh, our supporters attention to a few things, broadband expansion, okay? we have to follow every dollar that goes to broadband expansion. Uh, I like to liken it to how many um, uh, percentage of dollar bills go to the classroom and education. I can guarantee that on broadband expansion, we're not gonna see any of this money go literally to the classroom. Uh, so we gotta be careful as this crisis doesn't go to waste. Uh, another thing is uh, main care expansion. Um, you know, they're going to expand this beyond belief because there's a crisis and everyone needs help. So again, we got to chase the dollars here. This budget is $400 million more than the last one in the middle of supposedly the worst economic crisis since, since 2008. So, um, and then uh, one of the last things uh, is climate change, okay? So literally it's gonna be main care expansion, broadband expansion, and then climate change, you know? I know as I homeschool my children and as I deal with this in my day-to-day -day life, I am very happy I've only used my snowblower once, okay? But climate change and the dollars that go to climate change, we need to watch very, very, very closely, okay? So um, as it sits 287 bills um i will try to keep everybody updated with the rest of the team on as this stuff comes out um but just be very aware now we have some positive bills um on our side of the aisle that we'll be fighting for that there might be a climate that um once in a blue moon actually could be passed under uh, us all being in the minority for instance, all of the stuff that has been suspended under the state of emergency, where usually the government fees us and taxes us and takes all of our money, now over the past year isn't so important, okay? So we gotta make sure we keep all that stuff permanent. Uh, but for the sake of expediency, um, I will just end it with this. Uh, I think right now the most important thing that we're seeing right now is that uh, a constitutional amendment to make rank choice voting um, um, uh, in the constitution to affect every election, um, that bill has a public hearing in two weeks. So these are the things like while Rome is burning um, are being uh, um, considered in the legislature. So I just ask, ask everyone to be attentive, listen to us, Please, if you have some extra time, weigh in, call, email, Zoom, do whatever you can do, and let's stay all alert. And I want to thank everyone for participating tonight, and I'll end it right there. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, as I said before, if you have questions, go ahead and dump them in the comments section. I'm going to start calling on people here in just a minute. Before I do that, though, I want to also toss it over to Miss Heather Noyce, who is also with us here as well. And I know she always likes to say hello to everybody and give a quick update on our development activities and how the organization is doing. So Heather, how are you this morning or this evening? What time, what time is it? <laughs> Good evening. Uh, it's uh, five o'clock and uh, I'm, I'm in Franklin County. So uh, I'm in a snow globe. It's been snowing here for two days. Uh, it is so great to see everyone and thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. I love the enthusiasm and everyone's participation. Uh, and I am counting the days until we can all be together in person again. Uh, we've already started planning a slate of activities and events for 2021. And uh, I'm very eager for when we can physically be together. 2020 was a fantastic year. Each of you made our year very, very successful and all of this work possible. And uh, 2021, we've got a lot ahead of us as you are hearing tonight. Uh, your support means a tremendous amount to Maine Policy Institute. We are incredibly grateful for all you do, not just for your financial support, but for your phone calls, your testimony, for showing up, for participating. It's what changes things and it's how we're going to take our state back and keep our liberties uh, and our freedoms. So I just wanted to say thank you and uh, look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Awesome. All right, so now that uh, Heather is gone, and thank you very much, Heather, I think we can get into some questions here. So what I think I'll do, if you guys are okay with this, is rather than me reading what you wrote, I'll just call on folks who I saw asking a question and see if we can get a really quick 
quick uh, question from you, and then we'll, I guess one of us will uh, will tackle that question. I'll decide that when the, uh, when the first question comes through here. Uh, I believe the first one was uh, from Ken Capron, actually. Ken, I think I see you there. Go ahead and unmute your, uh, your mic and ask your question, sir. Where? <laughs> <laughs> you asked one about talking points. I think you were you were probably talking about yeah, like yeah. hours I mean, at that point. Have you got? Uh, I, I'm assuming you're working on or have talking points that we can use uh, over the next uh, three or four months because the message has to be uniform as to why this is not going to work out. And the penalty is that we elect Matt Gagnon to to be governor. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. <laughs> yeah, hey, can I want to talk about this? Or yeah, I'm glad to. I'm glad to. Yeah, Ken. So I'll get into a little bit of the sort of ideal policy that we're looking at. But uh, as Rob uh, Rob Chaffield noted in the chat earlier, you know, you really have to put uh, your your favorite politician and your least favorite politician up in this position, right? So it doesn't. It shouldn't matter who the individual is. It shouldn't matter whose party's in power or or what the philosophy of the governor is. Um, it's it's about a, a striking an equal balance. And so the legislature it has an equal place at the table in these decisions. Um, the, the thing that I wanted to mention when Matt was, when Matt was talking about what, uh, that particular point was that the state should be nimble to respond to crisis. It's important that there is some amount of time that the governor can act quickly because we want to we want to be able to respond to crisis effectively, especially if something is imminent. Um, but that's in order to give the legislature time to develop an appropriate response to actually get back to governing appropriately, because the legislature is where laws are made, not from the governor. So. Um, I think that's going to be kind of the frame that we put this in is uh, the individual shouldn't matter. It's about balance of power and it's about having equal branches of government. Well, Nick, I, I don't disagree, but I do in a way that I think it's idealistic to think that we're going to get both sides on this issue. I know we have to go after both sides, but I don't see I, from the Democrats I've talked to, they're not budging. Well, we'll see, Ken. I mean, we're going to be trying absolutely as hard as possible on it. And I do think there is room for some minor changes. I mean, if you're asking me for my honest appraisal of what could happen this year, I think we actually could get some changes. It's just not going to be my dream scenario. I think we might get some small revisions to uh, Title 371B and uh, and do something in that regard. And then perhaps some of the bigger reforms that we're interested in are, are things that are, are done down the line. But again, I pledge to you all my life's blood and work here on this one. I, I'm not letting this one go over the next several years if it takes us that long so and, and again it goes back to and i think uh, nick pointed this out you know rob your point uh which was half a question is about envisioning this in the hands of your foil right whoever is on the other side right a great example of this nationally would be you know for all the all the people who are on the left right now uh, applauding the i think uh i think it happened today or whatever uh, joe biden declaring a climate emergency or whatever it is he's doing you know, the emergencies are great when it's your person in charge, but Donald Trump declaring an emergency over the southern border is something that if you're on the left wing of American politics, you're not a big fan of and you don't like to see happen. And so envision the powers that we're asking you about in the hands of the person you dislike the most and ask yourself whether or not that's OK with you, because if the answer to that's no, then we probably shouldn't do it. We should probably be trying to find some way of achieving consensus or collaboration in some fashion, which I think Nick, uh, I think appropriately pointed out is definitely possible. You can give some sort of abil ability to be nimble and act quickly while having follow up and checks and balances. That's really the ideal system for us. Yeah, I think the, um, the pendulum has swung sort of too far to that that side. It's just coming back, getting back to that balance. And that, that should be the, the message, I think. Uh, Roberta, I believe you had a question as well. I'm, I can't see Roberta on my screen. She might be on screen number two. But if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, I'd love to hear it. All right. Oh, I do, I do see hers, Matt. Um, yeah, so she mentioned the four. Go ahead. Yeah, I, Oh, I'm not sure if she's she's on here, but um, she's still oh, on. But I think she might see, either not be with us right now or not unmuted yet. So why don't you go ahead and answer her okay. question, which is about the 14th Amendment. That's right. Yeah, she mentioned the 14th Amendment. And that was the argument for for Jacobson in that Supreme Court case in 1905 was that shouldn't I get the benefits of 
the securing of my liberty and, and so that my rights can't be taken away without due process. That's that's the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, essentially expanding that that guarantee through all the states, not just through the federal government, through the Bill of Rights. But the Supreme Court uh, didn't didn't take that argument, um, you know, that, and the, that's part of the federalism aspect, I think, in the 50, 50 laboratories of democracy aspect of our system of government is that the state legislatures get to make a lot of the choices and the the 10th Amendment uh, says any any power not delegated to the federal government uh, is is held by the state. And that includes police powers in emergencies. Um, the Supreme Court has has repeatedly, uh, you know, agreed with this precedent that that governor should have power. So that's why that's why what I'm saying is that the this is the the ball is in the state legislature's court. They get to write the law. They get to determine where that balance is and they get to strike that appropriate balance. Um, I'm glad to, to dive into some of the potential reforms that uh, that we're looking at, Matt, if that's all right. Yeah, really quickly, go ahead. Sure, sure. So um, so we have some bills that are in and, and some of them will raise the threshold to two thirds to continue a state of emergency, for instance. Um, but I noticed some really great reforms from our friends at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, they, they do great work uh, out, out West, but also all around the country. Um, and part of it is, you know, having these limitations and having these, these checks from the legislature, uh, but, some other ideas are to to signal to the judiciary that that these should be reviewed right so the legislature can write into the law that says any order that a governor makes has to be narrowly tailored meaning it has to rise to strict scrutiny if you're going to infringe on liberty you know the government the government uh the government's solution or plan should be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling interest um, and so we can write that into the law, but then also say that any challenges to a governor's emergency order should get expedited judicial review. This way, you sort of signal to, to the judiciary that, you know, don't leave this in, up to a political question. Don't say that this is up to the legislature uh, to decide through, through, you know, writing the law and it, it is what it is. Um, it's, a, it's important to judge the individual liberty of the, the aggrieved party uh, based on this this order. And so I, those those things I think are really interesting. No state has that, um, but it would require, you know, the the state to be more protective of, of liberty first, rather than sort of deferring to, you know, these political questions. Awesome. Um, continuing on with questions, Darren Hebold had one. Darren, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah, Darren Hebold. Uh, question for you and Nick and the staff. So <clears throat> two parts, just generally, where do we stand with the legislature right now? Are they in session and, you know, able to, you know, petition to reject this emergency order? And if so, you know, does that give them the ability to do that? Can we, can we have them, can we ask them as uh, constituents to do so? Uh, Mike, do you want to take this one? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Obviously, there's some elected officials on this uh, uh, Zoom call. I don't want to step on their toes. So as far as I know, on December 3rd, when they got sworn in, they adjourned at the sound of the bell, which means uh, um, Speaker Fecto and President Jackson, who are the leaders of both chambers, will quote unquote, ring the bell and bring them in. So um, we are handcuffed until um, these fearless leaders decide to convene both chambers. So um, it's unofficial, but um, from what I hear, they're gonna ask the revisor's office, which actually makes legislative requests bills, okay? They're gonna ask them to churn out as many of those requests into bills as possible. They'll then do a front load of work, of committee work, ask the committees to report as many of these bills out, and then whenever they're comfortable, they'll call in either chamber to work the bills. So the answer is no, I don't imagine they're going to be convening soon. Everyone on this call can pressure both Speaker Fecto and President Jackson to get them to do so. But being in the minority, we're at their behest. So um, that's unofficial, it's what I'm hearing. Um, but we're at their mercy and uh, when it's go time um, and, and they're going to work all these bills, I ask everyone to keep your powder dry and get ready to fire because it's going to go so fast and it's going to go 
double, triple session, I'm sure, whenever this happens. And, uh, and that's why I want to just take this moment to say it's very important during the committee process that we pound these people over the head. I want a divided report on every single one of these horrible bills because we're not going to let them trample all over us, okay? But anyway, um, I digress. So no, as far as I know, they're, they're probably not going to convene for a couple of months, Darren. And um, again, I know there's elected officials on here, but it's not... Um, this is not the forum for them to speak to that. So if I'm wrong, they can massacre me on my own time. And I'll end it there, please. Yeah, I think you more, more or less got it right. Um, okay, uh, there was also a question from David about the US Constitution and being the supreme law of the land. David, are you still with us here? I am. All right, go ahead and ask your question, David. Well, I just kind of, I'm just getting into this stuff in the last couple of years, uh, especially in the last few months in the year, the last 10 months. Um, what I don't quite understand is our legislature, just the branches of government, it's very simple. The legislature, from what I understand, is the only one that can make law. Now, I, I, I saw what he said about the governors having power. However, under the Constitution of the United States, guaranteeing our individual citizens' rights, how does that play into this? Don't we, does the governor in the executive branch have the right to make a law. I mean, apparently from what the other gentleman just read there, Nick, I believe, um, it appears so in some of these states. How can that be legal? How can that be lawful? I don't understand that. I yeah, mean, David. So it's it's lawful because the state legislature had wrote it, written it, excuse me, wrote it into law. Uh, the thing is that um, not every governor can create law. It's really, it's really a special case in North Carolina where there, there aren't those restrictions. Most of the time, governors can only suspend enforcement of certain uh, statutes or regulations. For instance, Governor Mills did, did certain things like that with licensing and uh, uh, healthcare licensing and childcare licensing and, and health, telehealth, things like that. Um, so that's really the extent of, of what you see, but it goes back to that federalism uh, doctrine where states get to to make make these laws and it's up to the court uh, to check the executive when they overstep the the execution of the law. Another question, if I can, please go ahead. The executive branch only has or, or the executive orders, from what I understand, are only applicable to those like the fire department people that they have you know oversight of people that work for the you know, the main department of labor or whoever, when they make those kind of, that shouldn't and doesn't apply to the citizenry from what I understand, according to our civil and human rights, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't, I, I well, just, just based on the way the law is written in an, in an emergency, the governor gets to decide, you know, the ingress and egress uh, of the disaster area, which is the whole state. Um, and the powers that are written for the governor in these times are, are extraordinarily broad and, and it does allow um, her to issue these orders. The question is really for the courts, like in Michigan, to say the law doesn't allow you to legislate. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't delegate legislative authority to the governor, but it, that depends on the, the status of the law and how the court would read it yeah and one one follow-up here before we move on to just uh, so everybody's understanding this a little bit better too um, constitutional law is a pretty tricky thing i mean there's there's a lot of moving parts inside of it and one of the things that's very important for this kind of conversation and topic is that legislative bodies may be the original point of authority for making a decision but they can surrender it um, sort of to an executive body. So for instance, with these emergency powers uh, laws, what the legislature did was say, in an emergency, this is how we want stuff managed. So we're gonna make a law here that hands the governor the authority to do these things. It's a lot like federally, when uh, the uh, when Congress you know instituted things like the War Powers Act, you know, that's actually the power to declare war and bomb people is actually in the hands of Congress. But they chose to say to the executive branch, uh, we, in, you know, bowing to the needs of the modern era and military matters or whatnot, you need to be able to act quickly. So we're going to surrender this power to you and you can exercise it. There are a lot of things that are challengeable in court for every stage of that, from the federal system all the way down to the state level. And not everything's been litigated, I suppose. But generally speaking, courts have been uh, very deferential to the decisions of state legislatures in doing that kind of thing in the interest of trying to have an orderly uh, exercise of power inside states because of the broad authority they're given in their constitution. Um, the I do want to continue to move on. David, do you have a really quick one? Can the legislature take it back? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Sure could. That's yeah. essentially what we're, uh, what we're arguing is that we want the legislature to reform its own powers here uh, and take back that, that balance. Floyd, I believe you also had a question about uh, the governor's executive orders. Uh, Floyd, are you with us still? I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I can answer my own question. My, my question was, is this proclamation of emergency, the one I think she's issued 10 of them now, is that the necessary predicate for her exercise uh, of these executive powers, issuing these executive orders? And I, the answer is yes. Um, I, I've read the statute that talks about this, and it's really clear to me when I read that statute, that state statute, that really what the legislature was contemplating at the time was not something like a pandemic, quote unquote. It was really talking about things like chemical spills. And that the language is, 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 is pretty clear. And I do think that it's worth thinking about a, a challenge to these orders that have been issued under that statute and to the, 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 the sweeping nature of the delegation of authority that's been made to our uh, executive branch um, under, under that legislation. I do think that it's challengeable. Um, that's that's one one comment. That would be a state law challenge in state court, not not the federal constitutional one. Um, I'd like to address the comments Nick was making. I think I think it's Nick uh, about the Constitution. Um, the state does have broad police powers under the Tenth Amendment. That's for sure. And and all of in all of these lawsuits that are happening all over the country. Uh, where those, the exercise of those powers is being challenged on constitutional grounds, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, et cetera, right to travel, right to privacy. They're all being shot down on the basis that these are legitimate exercises of the, the state's police power um, under this case called Jacobson, which is mentioned in your report. There is some basis for hope, though, um, in, in the, the uh, recent case that came out on Thanksgiving, which was, I think, important and significant the day the case came down. Gorsuch really ripped Chief Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, in that decision. And, and in his decision, he said Jacobson was passed 100 years ago. That's a case that came down 100 years ago, a very different set of circumstances there. It's not necessarily applicable anymore. And the Constitution may have been on a, on a holiday during this pandemic, but it's not on a sabbatical. And he called on the courts to start to enforce it um, um, uh, around the country. And that, that was a hopeful sign. It doesn't look like that's affecting any of these state, state governors or state attorney generals that are pursuing these radical COVID policies. Yes. Uh, yet, but you know, the Supreme Court seems open for business. I mean, that's a first amendment. And some people are saying it's limited to the first amendment. I the, don't know. Yeah, the the I think what's different about that case and and you're and you're right, a lot of the bigger cases like in Michigan happen on the state level and not at the federal level, but that big case yeah. with that that hammer of a Gorsuch uh, decision which was a thing of beauty, um it really was about how the state of New York treated houses of worship different than other businesses, preferred businesses, you know. Uh, I think Governor Mills has gotten out of a challenge like that because she treated all of these places gathering places the same. Uh, the thing about Cuomo's uh, orders in New York was that they could say, oh, well, here's a hot spot. Um, and houses of worship have, have a different level of stringency than these other businesses. So they were saying that, you know, essentially the argument for the, the Brooklyn diocese was that why does this church uh, have to keep under 25 people, but there's no restriction like that for the bike shop or the coffee shop, or they get 50 or something like that. It's the fact that the state is picking and choosing different ways of, of treating different things. And it's the crux of the house of worship too, is the, the uh, yeah. first amendment right to, to worship freely. I mean, that, nice that I think is, case. that was the crux of, of their first amendment challenge. I just wanted to make a quick comment and then I'll go. Um, in terms of legislative reform, I think your proposals are excellent. One I would add is that because it's extremely difficult for the citizenry to get information about the collateral consequences of these COVID rules, the, the, the government, the governor, the people promoting these COVID policies ought to have a duty to collect and furnish information to the legislators about the collateral consequences of their emergency rules. How are those rules affecting people? We hear about people getting sick and dying of COVID. You don't hear about the numbers of people dying because they're not getting medical treatment. 
You don't hear about the people with disabilities suffering and regressing because they can't get the services they need. This is real human suffering. And it's what makes the governor's orders irrational, frankly, even under a rational basis constitutional review. You can't justify protecting and serving a small segment of the population and allowing the rest of it to suffer because of a perceived pandemic. That is irrational. But, but, the, but that argument I just made hinges on having that data and information at our disposal. And they don't want us to have it, but they should be obliged to produce it to support and justify their policy making decisions. I absolutely agree. And, and I think that's a big part of the reform here to put the legislature at that uh, at that equal footing. So the governor has to go back and get a report from the legislature and, and the governor has to gain at least a majority vote. If there's an emergency going on in the state, it should be abundantly clear to everyone in the state to say nothing of all the legislators. So a two thirds vote, I think, is a pretty reasonable thing. And, and in that case, the governor would have to go up with Dr. Shaw and say, well, here are the metrics that we're using. This is why we still think an emergency exists. Today, they just get to say it in a press conference and the media doesn't give them any hard questions about it or press them about it. So they get to continue on. Um, but and, that, and, that's and exactly the point. In, if I can jump in, Nick, and that's the important thing. And we only have two minutes left, so I'm going to more or less wrap things up right now. But that's really the important thing about this. Is that Floyd's 100 percent right about the need for information. However, having done this job as long as I have, I know that the government doesn't give you anything they don't want to, even if they're required to. The thing that's really the most important to me in this whole process is that there is some sort of logistical mechanism that forces a chief executive, Republican, Democrat, independent, libertarian, socialist, or anything in between to have to actually answer to the legislature in some fashion. Because if that is something that is required, then those questions can be asked in committee. Those people who are, are your representatives in the legislature can request and make a big deal out of trying to get certain kinds of information from an executive branch department uh, so that they can make better decisions. Without that need to do that, without that need to go to prime minister's questions, if you will, and actually answer some of those hot, uh, those hot questions, you, they're not going to. You're going to get what we have now, which is basically a weekly press release where they tell you everything that they want to tell you, and the press dutifully sits there like stenographers and just writes down things without skeptically looking at it. So that's, that's the thing that ultimately we have to solve more than anything else. So unfortunately, we are more or less out of time. Mike, I know you wanted to say something really quick to charge up the troops on our way out the door. So I'm going to toss things to my friend Mike Quattrano here, and then we're going to wrap up things for good. Mike, go ahead. You're on mute, sir. Happens to the best of us, sorry. Uh, I just wanna say, we all know that elections have consequences, okay? So uh, I just wanna say that uh, in the Senate, us on the conservative side, uh, we had some gains in the House, but something that was brought to my attention that I see is that VLA, Veterans and Legal Affairs, which oversees, this is the committee that oversees all election laws, um, our fearless leaders uh, in the majority who uh, um, are on the same side of us ideologically, stack that committee eight to five, okay? So this concerns me. So we're looking at um, abolishing the electoral college, amending the constitution of the state of Maine to put in ranked choice voting, online voter registration, um, getting absentee ballots in, per in perpetuity for the rest of your life, okay? Um, not uh, having to Mike, I think we might have lost you there. All of our concerns here on this call, um, we need to focus on what the election laws are going to happen between now and the elect next election day. So I would say keep your powder dry. We need to keep a close eye on this, and then hopefully we can have a better discussion in another, in an, at another day. Thanks, Matt. All right. So with that, we have arrived at 530. So I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for joining us here um, for this discussion about emergency powers, obviously going to be an issue that dominates a lot of our conversations for not only this year, but probably several more to come. We really appreciate all of your activism and your attention for this. And I want uh, to echo what Mike just said here about being ready to be engaged. I mean, the best thing that we can possibly do is be active, be intelligent, respectful, dignified and and disciplined throughout the whole process so that we're actually engaging in the right way and we're not storming any capitals, of course. But uh, but along the way, that activism is going to be the thing that ultimately changes the laws in the state in the direction that we want to see them changed. So I want to thank you guys all for being involved here tonight and say uh, that I'm looking forward very much to seeing you guys again in person or virtually, whichever one we're allowed to do first. Thanks a lot, guys.